everyone. Thank you so very much for your patience. We did have some technical difficulties earlier. My name is Jen and welcome to another Aquarium Online Academy. Today we are going to be discussing kelp forests. So I'm very excited for you all to be able to participate in today and to be able to bring in your questions and observations. And clearly I'm not the only one in the studio. We have a giant sea bass that definitely wants to say hello. Uh, but controlling all the images, including this lovely animal right here, we have Talia. Uh, and then we also have uh, Allie, who's going to be bringing in any kinds of questions or observations that you might have. And so, like I said, today we're talking about kelp forest. If you have any kinds of questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. You can go on ahead and text us in 562-286-1838. I'm going to have Talia bring up that number for us. And then we also happen to have an email as well if you are watching this uh, after the fact. So you can go on ahead and email us down below at live at lbaop.org. All right, so let's go on ahead and talk a little bit about kelp forests. Our goal today is to talk a little bit about what is a kelp forest, how animals utilize this habitat, and then also what are some ways that we are protecting these kelp forests, or I should back up some of the challenges that they might face, and then what are some ways that we can help protect as we are talking about a kelp forest and conservation class today. So I'm gonna go on ahead and step off the screen for a little bit, and I would love for you just to make some observations about our kelp forest habitat. Um, of course, our kelp is all of this green stuff, plant-like stuff that we see behind me, and we'll get more into what it is and how it survives uh, you know, on its own. But in the meantime, I would love to just hear any or all of your observations, whether it be about the seaweed behind me, the animals, the exhibit, because this is our blue cavern habitat that is modeled after a real kelp forest off the coast of Catalina Island uh, here within the Pacific Ocean. So what do you notice? What do you see? Take a minute, write down those observations if you'd like, or if you prefer, just go on ahead, maybe, let a neighbor know, <laughs> let, your, let your sibling know, maybe a guardian know. What do you notice? Or feel free to talk to no one, like I do sometimes, being an only child. All right. Well, if you're thinking uh, there are animals, like our large sea bass in there, absolutely, right? So we do have some large fish that are in here. We also happen to have some smaller fish too, right? So we can see several right here. That are, uh, that are all around and swimming, right? So we have animals of different sizes that live in here. We even have different kinds of animals like sharks, right? So we have our leopard sharks that's swimming on by there. And we have all sorts of other different animals that are using our habitat, right? Um, and then we also happen to have lots of different kind of muted colors, right? So maybe some of you went ahead and noticed that we have some grays, some blacks, some silvers, as our, once again, our sea bass friend here is beautifully showing us, right? And then we also happen to have a lot of grays and blues, right? Amongst our rocks and our fish that we have here, right? Ah, oh, so I love how some of you are noticing the different animals too. We just got a text in saying that you see a shark and you're seeing that kelp is green and that there is a lot of blues, right? I'm sorry? Oh, a bass, absolutely. So here is an example of our leopard shark that also has those similar colors. And joining us uh, is actually Aaron. So welcome, Aaron. It's good to have you here. Aaron, if we go back to that kelp forest view real quick. So as we go on ahead and we think about our, our blue cavern that we have right here, right? There's lots of different animals and colors and shapes that we're seeing right here. But going back to our question of, well, how do these animals use this space? What do you notice? How are they using this space? Are they, do you see, you know, these large fish up at the very top? Are they more on the bottom? What about these smaller fish? Are there certain areas that they tend to live in? I'm gonna step off the screen again, and I'm loving these observations, so keep on bringing them on in. How are these animals using the space? And also, how would they maybe use that seaweed? Do you think they'd eat it? Hmm, 
Maybe, right? So maybe some of them use that seaweed for food. They might munch on it. What do you think might be some other uses? What are you noticing? Hmm. Well, there's that leopard shark again, right? If we think about it, most of these animals that we're seeing that are the, like our giant sea bass right here, right? And that shark, they're generally swimming towards the bottom, right? So we know that they're kind of hanging out maybe towards the bottom area. What about many of these fish? Where do you notice them hanging out? We have an operation where they just blend in. Oh, animals are blending in, absolutely. And then they might hide in seaweed. Yes, so that's another use, right? So maybe some of these animals, especially those, right? Like our sea bass here, who's so excited, right? They're maybe blending in really well with that seaweed, right? Or right with those rocks, right? Or maybe some of those fish that many of you saw, right? That are living kind of in the middle. Maybe they are hiding in that seaweed. Love it, right? Oh, here's even our eel. Everyone's out and about. I'm going to step off to the side because I bet that eel's going to come towards the middle unless our sea bass want all the excitement. Just like my two cats fighting for attention. Ah, very cool, right? So we're seeing an eel now too. So we have all sorts of different animals that will live in our kelp forest habitat. Some of them might only make small appearances like our eel, right? That'll slither away into maybe a crack or crevice, right? Other animals might use um, the seaweed to be able to hide in or to munch on, right? Or maybe even to lay their eggs, like our, our, uh, our leopard shark right there who lays eggs in little, uh, what we call mermaid's purses, that a lot of times looks like seaweed up above, right? So there's lots of different ways in which these animals use this kelp forest habitat. Now, if we go on ahead and we think about a forest, right? And we think about one on land, right? We think of lots of trees. Anything else kind of comes to mind when you think of a forest? Hmm. Well, I know for me, I kind of think about all the different animals that kind of live within that forest, right? Um, now, I may think of like birds. And if we think about a bird that lives in a forest, where in the tree is it going to hang out? Is it going to hang out in the top where the leaves and branches are? Is it going to hang out in the middle of the trunk? Is it going to hang out at the very bottom of the tree? What do you think? Well, if you're thinking probably more than likely inside the branches, right? You're absolutely right. So much like how some animals may have specific areas within a tree that they might choose to, to live in, right? Um, and use it in a specific way. Same thing for our animals actually in a kelp forest too. The seaweed is able to provide lots of homes and lots of resources for a wide variety of animals. Now the seaweed that we have here is very special off of our coast. It's called giant, uh, giant kelp and it can grow up to two feet a day. So this stuff actually within our aquarium is fake. It's not real. But if we did have real kelp, it would be a lot of maintenance because it would need a lot of sunlight, a lot of nutrients, just like how many kind of plants on land do, except these are algae, so they have similar features to them. But this kelp will grow so high that it would actually grow up to the very tippy top of the ocean that we see here, and it would fold over. So what we end up having here is a kelp canopy. Okay. And so this, we can see all this kelp just kind of folding over and kind of providing that, that top layer. If we think of like a canopy in a forest, right? All those trees kind of together, kind of binding together, right? Same thing here in our kelp. So we have a lot of this kelp canopy and some animals will live up in that kelp canopy, right? Can you think of any idea, any animals that may want to live up in the really tippy top parts of that kelp canopy? Because I bet that is a really good place to kind of hide, right? If you're thinking maybe baby animals, right? Maybe some smaller fish, right? Some of the smaller animals that may want to hide amongst all that seaweed. Absolutely, right? Now, there are other animals too. Some of those middle-sized fish that we saw earlier in our blue cavern that will live kind of in this middle region right here, right? So they might take advantage of the swaying seaweed right here. They may blend in like many of you were talking about, right? 
But what's really interesting is kind of the bottom portion of the seaweed, which you can't really tell here. But at the very bottom, um, we have something called a hold fast. And I think I should have one, so I'm going to step off the screen to show you real quick. But a hold fast is, well, it looks kind of similar to roots, but they're actually not roots. So remember how we mentioned earlier that these are algae, right? They're not exactly plants. Now, some of the differences between the two um, include that algae doesn't have any roots, even though it looks like it has a root-like structure. But like the name suggests, hold fast. It holds, and it actually holds the entire algae down. And that's the purpose of this root system. It doesn't actually, or what looks like roots, right? It doesn't actually bring any kind of nutri nutrients value into the actual algae itself. It just keeps it anchored down so that way it can sway in the water, just like we saw earlier. Now, what's really cool is that many of these animals live in and around the holdfast. Things like brittle stars and other small shrimp and other little invertebrates, animals without backbones, they can live and hide inside of this holdfast. And it looks like we're getting some observations in of some small fish, kind of like Nemo. Thank you so very much for sharing, right? So we have all these different animals and all these different ways in which they're able to use this and call this home, right? But what's really interesting is that, do you remember those giant sea bass that we saw earlier and how friendly and excited they were to see us and to spend time with us? Well, believe it or not, they are gentle giants in the ocean too. And here's a great picture of one. Thank you, Aaron. And so with this giant sea bass that we have here, they are large, slow fish that are very curious animals. And as a matter of fact, a long time ago, a lot of folks a lot of hungry folks were interested in looking for some food to eat in the ocean. And so a lot of fisher folk went ahead and made these animals, these cuties, right, really easy, easy targets to fish and to eat. And they would feed a lot of people. So why not hunt these, right? Um, and so what ends up happening, they were so easy to hunt that their populations went down a lot. And so because of that, these animals, um, and also these animals are, are kind of far apart. They don't hang out in groups or schools together. Their numbers went down, and there weren't too many off of our coast. So we had to put some regulations on them to make sure that we protected them and their populations. And so now we're able to slowly uh, count them. We have different kinds of programs that are allowing uh, us to kind of take note of how many w are within their population and ways to restore their population. And so we're doing that in a few ways, right? One way that's uh, working out is a variety of organizations have come together to create this uh, citizen science project, basically, where scuba divers or maybe even snorkelers, if they're able to see these sea bass, are able to take pictures of these sea bass and put them into a database. And what's really cool is that these sea bass are able to, you can tell the difference between them by looking at their spot patterns. So not all of their spot patterns are actually the same. They're all little snowflakes, right? They all have their individual designs. And so when folks that are in the water and see a sea bass take a picture of it, you can upload it into that database. And then you can see if someone else has spotted that sea bass, where it's been. And, you know, if you see it again, right, or you could take a picture of it and then you can see where it's been since then. So it's a cool way to kind of get to know the different animals that, that live in your neighborhood. So that's one way. Another program that's going on that we here at the Aquarium of the Pacific are part of is a sea bass program. So we are working uh, with a handful of other organizations to be able to breed uh, little sea bass and to bring them, uh, bring them back into the ocean. So here is actually one of our very first young ones. This is uh, Utaka, and Utaka still lives here at the aquarium, and he was the first uh, giant sea bass that has been, you know, successfully bred and is currently living here at the aquarium. Now, this is his baby picture, so he looks a little bit older now, but how can you not love this face, right? It's so cute. And so we are now working with many other institutions to be able to, um, you know, breed some sea bass, to be able to create new babies and eventually reintroduce them back out into the wild to increase their populations. So basically with these animals, right, um, there were, their populations were in decline due to some overfishing that was occurring. 
Now there was another animal actually that was hunted uh, and their numbers went down to very low numbers due to their glorious fur that they happened to have. And that would be, a, would be, of course, our sea otters. So here off the coast of California, we have southern sea otters. And these sea otters have the most dense fur of any mammal on Earth. Super dense, super soft. And since these animals live on the very tops of kelp forests, it made it really, uh, really easy for these animals to be hunted for their furs. And so their numbers, too, also went very low, um, and they were put as an endangered animal. And so it looks like we have an observation of the giant sea bass. It's so small and cute. Absolutely, right? I totally agree. I totally agree. It's oh, one of the cutest babies, definitely, for sure, right? Uh, so thank you for sharing your observation, right? And these animals also very cute, right? Um, and so, you know, it's really kind of... Um, I, a fortunate, I guess, for us to be able to right now kind of focus on some of the cuter animals, right? Because it's easy to want to save a habitat when we're looking at really cute animals such as our sea otter, but also our giant sea bass. Um, now, believe it or not, there is another animal that was also easy pickings, and that's actually our abalone. Personally, I think they're equally cute, but I'll let you be the judge in a little bit. And these abalone are snails. Yes, I know, right? snails. I, I love a good snail, don't you? Right? And so these abalone were actually um, loved for their, their meat, believe it or not. And so what they ended up doing was they just, they just sit there. As you can see, they don't really do a whole lot, right? I mean, they're very, very cute, and I'm sure you would all agree, right? Um, but these animals, you could just, whoop, get them off the rock and then bring them up to be able to eat. And so uh, many folks enjoyed the taste of abalone and they were so abundant at one point in time that they were taken out of the ocean here, there, and nom, 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 just eaten away, right? To the point where they were actually the very first invertebrate animal without a backbone to be put on the endangered species list because of how voraciously people ate them. They just couldn't get enough of these tasty critters, right? And so um, that put them on the endangered species list too. Now, there are about, I want to say, nine-ish varieties of abalone off of our west, nine or maybe 13 different varieties of abalone off of our west coast. And uh, some of them, a lot of them have been overfished. Um, we here are really kind of, I think we have the red and the white abalone, um, but there are others are off of, of course, but these are two of the ones that we are showcasing here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. And, you know, many of them each have their own individual struggles uh, from all of their populations really kind of being super low. And due to um, some other instances of disease and whatnot, some of their populations have had a rocky time on coming back. And so with that, um, you know, they were put on the endangered species list and there's now different breeding programs uh, that are trying to work on getting these abalone populations back up. And so one way that we're getting a chance to do so is through also another kind of uh, partnership of a program in which we are growing baby abalone up and we are trying to find different habitats to where they have the tastiest kinds of algae for them to eat and for them to survive. Now it's tricky though, right? Because if we put these babies out into the wild, they might be predators that are just sitting and waiting to eat them. So it's, uh, it's definitely been a learning experience in trying to figure out what are the best conditions and how can we monitor to make sure that these babies are successful and grow up to be nice and big in the wild, right? Now, part of the problem with them out in the wild, aside from disease and low numbers, is that these, uh, these abalone are actually, uh, they, they spawn. So as they go on ahead and are ready to reproduce, you know, they spawn directly into the water. And the goal are for the gametes, right, the sperm and the egg, to be able to combine to form new baby abalone. But if these abalone are so far apart that maybe spawning's happening here, and then the next set of spawn is like way far away, it might not be able to meet to make these baby abalone. And so we at least need a certain number of these abalone within a certain area to be able to help bring up the populations. So our goal is to hopefully reintroduce some more of these abalone so that way we can have more natural spawning events occur that are successful to bring up that abalone population. 
Now we did get some questions of was it oh why why was it hard to successfully breed giant sea bass? That is a great question. Oh, and it looks like we got an observation of abalone. Look cool. Totally agree with you on that. Um, so you know, there's certain animals where they are easier to be able to reproduce, and others it's trickier. And so you know, sometimes there's different key factors that are necessary to kind of help uh, an egg to basically thrive. Sometimes it's due to you know you have to have a current that's that's going along um, to to hatch these eggs or to to make sure that they stay viable and uh, are able to develop and then kind of hatch out of the egg. Other times it might be a change in temperature. Other times it might be a change in pH. There are so many different factors that are necessary for a, for a successful hatch to occur that it really kind of depends on that particular animal. And sometimes it may even change depending upon the species too. So just because you have, you know, a general formula of, oh yeah, I can probably hatch these fish this particular way, there's always a handful that maybe have certain special requirements and if it's never been done before well you have to go through a lot of trial and error to then be able to figure out what is that missing piece that you need to successfully breed these animals right and then once you find that out you can share that with all other organizations through papers and conferences um, and all sorts of ways to be able to spread that knowledge to others so that way more conservation efforts can help with our giant sea bass here. It's a great question. Thank you for asking. We did get another question. Do abalone ever move? Yes, slowly, but they do move. Uh, abalone have a large foot on them and that large foot helps them to stick but also helps them to move. And so they're able to move very slowly. Uh, their food source doesn't move, which is actually algae. So they have a, uh, a mouth with a tongue on it. And that tongue basically moves around kind of like a lawnmower conveyor belt, and they're able to scrape the algae off of the rocks. So they don't really have to move super fast, but they can move. And then here's that foot that we were kind of talking about earlier. Um, and that foot, they can either, they can move and, and scoot along the rocks that way. Good question. And uh, what can a student do to help conserve these animals and habitats? So Miss Amber's class, great question. And that works perfectly because uh, that's our goal here is to talk about different ways in which we can help conserve these kelp forests and some of these animals, right? Now today we talked about some common themes of overfishing um, as well as yeah, overfishing and hunting, right? And so with that, there are several ways that you can help. One is by eating sustainable seafood. And what that means is that, you know, you are eating seafood that's caught responsibly and in a manner that really limits the effects on other, you know, neighboring animals that are not meant to be caught, such as bycatch. Um, and so with that, right, um, if you are, you know, f using, if fisher folk are using sustainable methods, and that means that, you know, the seafood that you're going to be eating is, A, their population is doing well enough that it's A-OK -okay to eat, and two, that it's, you know, allowing uh, the least amount of disturbance to other animals and habitats as well in the nearby area. Another thing that you could do is pretty much eat locally and explore different kinds of seafood. We here in the United States are very set on certain types of fish, right? We like, you know, maybe like cod or, you know, rockfish or something along those lines or maybe snapper right um, but trying out and being an adventurous eater is actually really helpful because then that helps support other fisher folk that are you know that are fishing for other varieties so that we were not just focused on one particular type of population expanding your diet and finding fun ways to be able to eat different kinds of fish is also very helpful and it helps keep these communities and the animals that live off of our oceans a little bit more balanced too. So being an adventurous eater is definitely helpful too, right? So those are just a handful of ways in which, you know, um, you can help our, our populations and our oceans today. Now that we didn't get a chance to touch base on a whole other different ways uh, that, are, that are possible for conservation, including marine protected areas, where it's basically a national park that's underwater. So visiting these different mini kind of underwater national parks is another great way to help kind of, uh, you know, 
support many of these underwater areas, and you can see lots of great animals. So if you're interested in checking out, you know, underwater kelp forest or seeing lots of really diverse and lots of different kinds of fish, marine protected areas are a great place to visit and a nice safe space for many animals where no fishing can occur. Um, and you can just kind of be there with the animals to observe. So it's less disturbed and it's a nice place to check out. So would definitely recommend that too. Now, um, with that, just want to say thank you so very much. There are still more ways in which we could definitely protect our oceans. And you can learn so by either checking out some of our other previous kelp force and conservation classes, as they're actually not all the same. All of our educators definitely have a little bit of a different spin that they like to put on these classes. So definitely feel free to check some out of those other classes out as well. But if you do have any other questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. Uh, just go on ahead and email us down below at live at lbaop.org. Uh, but in the meantime, if there are any teachers out there that are watching, we'd love for you to be able to text in any of the numbers that uh, of the amount of students that you are streaming this to. This really helps us to be able to prioritize our programming and uh, get a better idea of how many folks are watching out there and using this as a resource. So just thank you so very much again for joining us today. And thanks for your participation. And we'll see you next time. Take care.